Hello and welcome back to the Superior Comic Show, your Irish pop culture weekly show where all your dreams become disappointments. Uh, today on the show, we have a comic writer who was making a big bit of noise on the Kickstarter scene, uh, Curtis Clow. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. It's always fun to talk comics, especially my own comics. So it's cool to be here. Yeah, you, you were like, I just read them. You read and write them. You know, you... <laughs> basically like a football pun though i just chat shit yeah man it's uh i love them so much that i started making comics look uh fair fair play to you i wouldn't be able i don't think people would be interested too much in my comics <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get straight into it tell me about the the kickstarter that's going on at the moment and um, it's for slightly exaggerated issue two yeah this is my 11th kickstarter is for issue two of slightly exaggerated it's a four issue series. It's kind of like a fantasy series inspired by like Studio Ghibli and like Indiana Jones mixed together. Uh, it's like this whimsical fantasy world with flying sea creatures, talking animals, lots of like just weird stuff. We went really far out there with this story. And it's about a dying girl that has to uh, steal back a sacred artifact from a crazed cult leader in a world where religion is law. So it's uh, this is kind of like her last few weeks alive and she's trying to give her life purpose, um, even though she's kind of like an atheist and it doesn't necessarily line up with her beliefs, but she's still trying to do right in her in her last moments. Yeah, I read the first issue that you sent over to me there. And well, first things first, religion being law sounds like any of our Irish listeners will know that was basically us up till about three years ago. Really? I'm not too familiar with, uh, you know, like Irish history. That's interesting. We're, we're slowly starting to push the f effects of the church on law out. Wow. But, interesting. Uh, yeah, no, it's, I loved it. The flying uh, man, uh, stingrays or man, I'm, I'm getting my sea creatures mixed up here. <laughs> yeah, they're like, uh, I guess like stingrays or manta rays, kind of like yeah. giant manta rays. And there's like I've, some flying wheels and stuff. Just really pushed it to like just weird uh, fantasy world. Uh it's more I call it like more of like a whimsical world like I also write a series called Beastlands and that's more grounded in like medieval fantasy there's no magic no talking animals or anything and then this one this series with my co-creator Pius Bach we really pushed it just to go crazy and have fun with it and just re be really imagin uh, imaginative in the world and you know talking animals the uh, the main character Mia she has a talking sidekick named Winston he's like a small little frog so it's really crazy with it yeah, no, I, I love that. Like the seeing the manta rays, I was I was gonna say I was caught between manta ray and stingray. I almost said manatee, and I was like, no, those are a lot bigger. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, at first, um, I kind of had to look again. I was like, was that like a ray flying in the sky? <laughs> <laughs> but um, the story, you really did. You pushed it. It's like I like your use of, re in my opinion, realistic language there's swear words in it and that's just in my opinion it's the way people would actually talk in those situations yeah it's like. uh it's kind of just authentic to my writing voice like i feel like that's how most people talk uh i write kind of more adult i guess more adult books uh you know there's curse words and stuff and even in my other series beastlands it's about like teenagers and they swear and stuff too and sometimes it catches people by surprise but i remember how it was being a teenager and how you know how people really talk and communicate especially in these worlds where you know, your life's on the line, like slightly exaggerated. She's dying and she's caught by the law and stuff. And it's, I just feel like it's more realistic how people would actually talk. Yeah. Yeah. And um, in regards to, I'm actually really looking forward to issue two of slightly exaggerated. I really enjoyed reading the first issue. I, I want to know, are we going to go into Mia's backstory and how she got this? A disease? little bit. Yeah. So I, I keep a lot of that vague. Uh, it's only a four issue series. So the, her full story will be wrapped up in four issues. So we have three more left. And uh, yeah, like I, I didn't really explain too much of how she got. You kind of like see like the stone growth on her arm and it's starting to spread and that's what's killing her. So we'll go a little bit into how that happened, but I don't want to overly explain it. I want to leave leave some questions in the world for sure. Yeah, 100 percent. Like I'm I've, I have questions already and it's <laughs> I'm only one issue in. Um, and if I'm, if I believe, right, I was looking at it there before we came on. You've actually way surpassed your goal on the Kickstarter now. Yeah, it's uh, it's doing really well. I can't complain. It's uh, we hit our goal. I think like five or six days in. This is my eleventh Kickstarter, so I've just kind of built up a following on the platform. And Kickstarter is kind of have like a snowball effect where the more you do, the more you'll have fans that if they like your stuff, they keep coming back and buying your stuff. So it gets easier the more you do, as long as you're consistent and put out good work and fulfill all the rewards of your previous Kickstarters. 
Yeah, no, like almost 500 backers on this one as well. It's like it's a huge number. It's... Yeah, man, it's uh, I get yeah, I can't complain. It's, it's going amazing, and I just hope things I hope things keep going well. It's uh, it's it's been a lot of work uh, doing Kickstarters. You have to fulfill everything yourself, print it all yourself, um, and then you know send out all of the rewards on your own. So it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. It's a really intimate uh, connection you have like with your fans and Kickstarter backers. I've only done um, like I haven't done any direct market releases yet with any publishers. Hopefully, I'll have more of that in the future. But uh, I feel like all of this experience has really helped me learn how to like market my books and you know just that intimate connection with my fans. And when will um the issue two be released then for all the so the kickstarter has like five more days it'll end on march 10th it takes a couple weeks to get the kickstarter money and then um pius is still working on the art so he probably will have the art all done within like two months and then it's just about printing it and shipping it out so we should have everything sent out within five or six months so before before the end of the year anyway yeah before the end of the year yeah we're already talking about when we can get we're going to do one more kickstarter for issues three and four um and then that will tie up the whole story so we're already talking about when we can try to plan that last kickstarter for the last two issues yeah i'll, I'll definitely be keeping an eye out i've i've noticed kickstarter has become a lot more popular in terms of uh, comic writers and all now in the last few years as you said this is your 11th one and you've built up a backing and a following on the platform yeah i started i mean if it wasn't for kickstarter i wouldn't be a comic writer today and now i'm able to make a living writing comics and it's, it's my dream so if it wasn't for kickstarter i wouldn't be here but then in with the pandemic uh last year i was kind of worried you know if uh if people would still be backing kickstarters and i think the one good thing about the pandemic, you know, it's a horrible thing, but it, uh, it's kind of helped Kickstarter in a way that comic shops were shut down. I think it brought in a lot of new audience. And then you saw a lot of big names and big companies coming to Kickstarter, like Scott Snyder had a Kickstarter and, you know, Boom Studios is on there. And I, now I see Skybound Entertainment on there. So it's like, I think Kickstarter is definitely not going away. It's getting more popular and you're seeing these bigger names come to the platform. It's cool. Yeah, I think um, going forward, kind of it's, especially even for the bigger publishers and bigger names, like you said, getting the money to directly from the fans shows them how much interest there actually is in their project rather than getting company funding releasing it and it completely flopping exactly yeah i mean you can make anything you want on kickstarter as long as you can hit your funding goal as long as you have fans like you don't need anybody you don't need permission from any publishers or anything you can tell whatever story you want to tell as long as you have fans that want to buy it yeah yeah and where did the inspiration for uh, slightly exaggerated come from as, as you said it's very kind of you just dived into it and went off the wall yeah i mean partially i'm a big studio ghibli fan i grew up watching all their movies princess mononoke spirited away like all of those movies really speak to me i love miyazaki and his style of storytelling so it's partially inspired by that and then kind of like a treasure hunter story with like indiana jones or the uncharted video game series but then also it's just my co-creator pius bach he's um I saw some of the work he did on a different Kickstarter project and that's how I found him. Then he went on to do some more work on Boom Studios for some like Firefly series and magicians and stuff. And me and him were always talking about doing a series together. And I just thought his style was perfect for this like weird fantasy world. So it was kind of kind of like a world that I imagine, you know, specifically for his art style. I kind of, uh, I try to find my collaborators, I try to find like a specific artist depending on like the style of story and such. Yeah, no, his art style kind of really pops off the page as well in issue one. It's like you said, it's definitely suited to fantasy. Like it's, I wouldn't link it in with a superhero book, but it's completely perfect for a fantasy book. And yeah, it's a really original style. I mean, he's he. I just feel lucky to be working with him. He's he's one of my favorite artists, so it's cool to get to work with him and tell stories with him. And really, I like working with artists that have like original style. And then you know, it, it, as long as it fits the story that it needs, I think his is perfect for this whimsical fantasy world. Yeah, no, it's completely awesome. Uh, but let's talk about your other one that um, you just mentioned there, um, Beastlands. Yeah. Um, that one, um, I really enjoyed as well. I was I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I was <laughs> irritated it ended at issue one. I kind of like, are we going to see an issue two? Oh, we, we have uh, five issues done for that one. So oh, really? yeah, this past summer, we kickstarted issues four and five. Those are done. I was actually just shipping those out now. So those are done and we're already working on issue six and seven. So we um that series is uh it's kind of like pokemon meets game of thrones it's a, it's about a boy that has to um save his companion beast and uh friends before he pushes them too far and there's like a tyrannical king trying to eliminate all the beasts from the world um it's this fantasy world that's like i said it's more grounded in like medieval 
And uh, some people have companion beasts that are like about the size of a horse. They can ride them and stuff. But these are more like pets. It's, uh, you know, these, these beasts don't have magical powers or anything. They could die. They can get injured. It's really inspired from, uh, I got a dog in my mid-20s and she was hit by a car. And it, I had to care for her. Luckily, she, she survived and like made a full recovery. But it was, uh, I, was, I tried to put that in the story, that kind of relationship that you have with pets and how close you grow to them, you know? Yeah, I find um, a lot of comics and shows don't really delve into that relationship with pets a lot and if i find pets are kind of just there uh, to be there that's yeah that's yeah for this story i definitely wanted to have real consequences where you really have to be a good uh you know caretaker for these beasts and you know they could get injured they could die and then not to mention you have this crazy king going to eliminate them all and, and execute them all that you see like early on in issue one yeah no i get issue one now i found out issue two is out there i'm gonna have to go looking for it because i have so many questions i want to know the whole backstory of the king's daughter i want to know where renzo is is he safe (laughs) (laughs) thank you yeah it's that's been a fun series to work on and then it was the same way where i had that idea for that series for a while you know i grew up in the 90s so pokemon is i've always been a fan of pokemon it's really inspired me and so this is kind of my way to you know, show my inspiration, but it's also more of an original world where, you know, there's no magic or anything. And then I saw Joe's art. This is the first comic she's worked on. She's my co-creator on that series. And um, she's just killed it. Like her art's amazing. Everybody loves her art. So I was lucky to find her. And I knew as soon as I saw her art style, I thought it'd be perfect for the Beastland series. And luckily things have worked out where we've been working together for a few years now. And right now she's drawing issues six and seven. So it's exciting. Yeah, no, the style, like the art and the writing really tied together. It gets let's let's be honest here it's, it's not a book for uh young yeah children. <laughs> yeah definitely not there's lots of violence there's, there's curse words in that one as well it's uh it's kind mm-hmm. of more of the tone if if you've read like deadly class and stuff kind of like that age of teenagers where it's more mature even though it's about kind of like these high school type kids in their teens yeah and it's the main character his name is escaping me sorry i have it open here in front of me uh, uh main character mac yes he's um Again, people that are listening to this are probably way ahead of me in the issues because I've just read issue one. But like his deal, he seems to kind of want to be a loner, but doesn't want to be a loner. He's kind of very headstrong and yeah, man, it's uh, he he's uh, he kind of pushed away all of his friends. He wants to find out what happened to his father, and um, he's ended up alone. He's even pushed away his beast, the uh, the beast that's supposed to be with him for the for his whole life, and um. And you'll kind of see his arc throughout the series where he kind of learns that he needs people, he needs his beast and he needs friends. So hopefully it's not too late and he's able to save them and he doesn't end up a loner and, you know, he won't survive. And this is a world where, you know, at the beginning of issue one, they're attacked by these scavengers. You have other dangerous beasts. You have this king in, in his army. It's a really dangerous world where there's a lots of uh, lots of danger that you could get into. So if you're alone, it's going to be even harder. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you, you said you grew up in the 90s like myself. I don't know if you took any inspiration from this but he reminds me a bit of matt from digimon and um, if you remember that show oh yeah yeah I, I like digimon a lot too digimon i mean all those things inspired me uh Yu-Gi-Oh, digimon pokemon they were all inspirations growing up yeah yeah i, I can definitely see that and that it's like pokemon like you said pokemon cross with game of thrones um just for that more kind of i'm an adult but i still enjoy this stuff generation Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, because I feel like, I mean, I was a huge fan of Pokemon, but, and I still play some of the games today, but I feel like it never really aged. It's still for kind of younger kids and it's never quite aged like how I imagined it it could. So this is kind of for maybe the Pokemon fan that's all grown up now and wants a more like mature story, but still in this like beautiful fantasy world where it's, you know, where you have these giant beasts and stuff. Yeah. And do you have an issue number that you're going to end that off on or is just, just, you're going to keep rolling? I mean, for now, I have that story outlined for 10 issues. And then for indie comics, I mean, luckily, we, we've been really successful where the last Beastlands Kickstarter made over 50,000 for issues four and five. And it's just crazy. I could never imagine it doing that well. So, um, but I mean, it, if, if things keep going well, and then it just depends on my co-creator, if she wants to keep drawing it, uh, Joe, like I would love to do 15, 20, 25 issues. I have lots of ideas for this world and story. But for now, outline for 10. And then it just depends on my co-creator, her schedule and, and how successful we are uh we have a deal for a publisher that's going to be putting out the trade paperback for volume one of beastlands um uh, early next year so that'll be exciting to see how that does and maybe if everything's going well i would love to keep going yeah yeah oh, no, when that comes out make sure you send me a message on twitter i'll be uh, i'd like to get the trade paperback and read definitely all yeah man that'll be like one of my first direct market releases so i can't wait for that and then 
you know, Kickstarter is a, uh, it's a pretty limited audience. Like you're able to make good money on there and, and it funds your projects, brings them to life. But at most, like we only had a thousand backers on the Beastlands Kickstarter. So with a direct market release and like a big publisher behind us, uh, I think it'll bring a lot more eyes to the series, which will be cool to just get, you know, more people reading our comic. It'll be really fun. Yeah. And have you thought of, like you said there, you have it outlined for 10 issues, but you'd go as you keep going as long as you can. Yeah, I would love to get to 25 issues or something. As long as as long as my co-creator wants to keep going, it's up to her. Yeah, and to me, when I uh, read that, it has a lot of um, what's the word I'm looking for? It has a lot of potential for like spin-offs or you know, turning into other characters. Almost like the group could be like almost like your Justice League or Avengers, and then split off into their own separate worlds. Yeah, I've definitely thought of ideas for that. I would like to keep these three characters for, you know, if we could get to 15 or 20 issues. And then, uh, yeah, definitely uh, some some more side characters in volume two that you'll see that I feel like are uh, pretty interesting and could probably have like their own story or own series or maybe even like a novel or something on their own. Um, that'd be fun. I mean, I think it's an interesting world where you can like tell so many interesting ideas and uh, so many things you can do with these kind of companion beasts. So, uh, yeah, I agree. I, I would love to tell some more like side stories in the world too. Yeah, that'd be unreal. But, um, I think I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> um, with Kickstarter, like you said, this is your 11th. Let's take it back. Have you ever looked back all the way back at your first Kickstarter to where you are now? Yeah, man, it's uh, it's crazy. My first one was in 2017. And it was just it wasn't even for a full comic. It was for like a poster print of a two page comic. And the goal was, I want to say like $140. And we had 12 backers and made maybe like $200. And it was just for me to kind of like learn the platform and figure out Kickstarter because it's uh, a lot goes into it just you know sending out surveys fulfilling rewards and uh you know updating your backers and all that and then a couple months later i did the first issue for a sci-fi series called the wild cosmos and um i mean that was like 300 backers and maybe six thousand dollars and then it just kind of kept growing from there uh you definitely have to start small and then like i said it has like a snowball effect where it could keep growing if you keep launching and stay consistent keep putting out quality work and it could definitely keep growing yeah, like, like you said, they're from 140 to now. Like, like you yeah. said, uh, Beastland's got 50,000. Like, it's just... Yeah, it's crazy. Um, hell of a snowball. I mean, yeah, it's a great snowball. I mean, yeah, for, for only from 2017 to now, 2021, it's it's grown a lot. And I've been able to... I quit my day job uh, like a year and a half ago now um, to do this full time. And that was always my dream. So I can't complain. Like, I'm, I'm just feel lucky that I get to do this full time now and make comics and ship them out and print them and everything it's it's fun yeah and you're doing a hell of a job of it have you you attended any comic cons or have you any intentions to set up a table at any comic cons or yeah yeah i've attended uh, i've attended a lot here in the united states um i've been to like rose city comic con that's a really big one in portland la comic con a, a lot around this uh the west coast of uh united states and then uh, that's been fun. That's where I got to meet some publishers and stuff. And that's where actually we were able to meet a publisher that is going to be putting out the Beastlands Volume 1. Uh, hopefully that'll be announced later this year. But yeah, that, it's really important as an indie creator, especially to get, like, get a table in Artist Alley and you get to meet fans and make new fans and get your books out there. You meet publishers. It's like uh, it's really good for networking and stuff. But I mean, unfortunately, with the pandemic, the last Comic-Con I went to was... Uh, uh, last January in 2020 before everything went down. So I'll be looking forward to maybe later this year with the vaccination rolling out and stuff. Hopefully they can able to like bring back some shows. It's, it's fun. And especially getting to travel for them and stuff. I, I really enjoy it at this point in my career. I think it's really important. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we can get back to that soon. Yeah, no, I, like I said, I'd say meeting fans face to face is quite important. Even for myself, when I started up this podcast, it was meeting the artists and the writers face to face to get potential guests. It was nerve-wracking but it's it's what has to be done you build up a relationship like you have with your um, yeah yeah i've gotten a lot more comfortable talking with fans and stuff I'm, I'm i'm sure during my first few i was really nervous and it's different to put yourself out there like that but now i enjoy it i really i know some like experienced writers get kind of burnt out of the whole scene going to shows and all that but at this point i haven't i'm definitely not burnt out i really like it like traveling we traveled to portland for rose city comic-con it was a blast like and then even just meeting other uh you know other writers and artists it's really cool to connect with them and see what books they're making it's fun yeah, and with like I said, with them cons being called off, how important has social media been for you kind of keeping your backers and keeping your 
loyal fans. Yeah, I mean, I use social media to update on the projects and stuff. I mean, that's like all we have now because shows are, are have been have been closed for the past year. And then especially that was right when right when I quit my day job and then show shut down. And I, I kind of rely on shows to meet publishers and put myself out there. So now you just have to share your stuff on social media as much as, uh, you know, social media can be an addiction and, and there's lots of negatives of it, but it can be good too. It, it helps you get the word out there. That's where I find a lot of the artists that I work with on social media. You can find great artists on there. Um, so yeah, you have to stay active on that and make sure you share your projects. So hopefully the right people see it. Yeah. And I think that um, I've interviewed, I don't know if you're familiar with the show, I've done a, interviewed a couple of artists and a couple of writers in the show from the big two. Have you ever sent something in to the big two? I know a lot of uh, indie writers have sent stuff in and got the rejection letters. Some give up and some just get a fire lit under them. No, I, I've never sent them anything. Um, I, I've seen like Jim Zub. He's a, he's a big writer who gives out a lot of advice for aspiring creators and stuff. And I, I've seen him say like, you just got to like make your own stuff and hopefully they come to you. I don't know if there's, if there's a way to, I don't know. I guess I would have to get lucky for like maybe a Marvel or DC editor to just see my stuff and then hire me to maybe write some stuff. I mean, that'd be awesome. I would, I would love the opportunity to, you know, work with them, but it's never happened yet. Uh, I've, I've definitely sent pitches to more creator owned publishers and some get denied and stuff. I feel like it's a lot easier uh, going to conventions and like meeting editors in person uh, rather than just like, I, I haven't had much luck just submitting online. It's uh, it, it's tough. It's hard. So many, there's so many great projects and so many people submitting stuff, you know, I feel like you have to have more of a personal connection. Yeah. Well, look, it probably worked out for the better um, in a weird way. There has, if you had got picked up by one of the big two so far, we mightn't be getting all of these, uh, Kickstarter yeah. Creator on yeah i mean this is i mean I, I would like that experience to have some work for hire gigs and it's just cool to get paid to write comics like that's yeah. the dream so of course that'd be cool to write some of these big name uh heroes and stuff but uh, i got into comics because i really love creator owned comics and this is this is why i'm here so it'd be cool to do some of that on the side but i'm definitely the most important thing to me is my series like beastlands and slightly exaggerated that i own that i co-create with these artists it's it's the most fun thing uh that's that's why i love comics yeah yeah, I guess kind of having full creative control and, you know, building these characters yourself rather than taking on an already established one. Yeah, man. I mean, that would be fun to like play in somebody else's sandbox. And it's, it's a, a character that's already established. But uh, yeah, I really love trying to tell a good story in these kind of worlds that we make up ourselves and these characters that aren't established. So I, th I think that's what I love the most for sure. So you mentioned there that uh, writing comics for a living was kind of your dream, like always. What comics did you read growing up that kind of pushed you into really wanting to write comics for a living? Oh, man, I, I didn't read them too much when I was like a, a young kid. I had like a few random issues and I always was interested in them in like uh, in like I felt like I was pulled towards them, but I didn't know too much about them. Like I had some random Spider-Man issues, Silver Surfer issues, but uh, Wolverine issues. But I, I never was like a regular reader. Like, I don't know if I just didn't have any comic shops by me and I didn't have the internet back then to just like do research. I was too young. Um, so I was always pulled towards it. And then even like I can remember as a young kid, I was making my own comics, even though I wasn't reading too many. Um, I still have some like pages where I was writing and drawing my own comics. And then uh, I just knew I, I felt pulled to do something like creatively. Like I was thinking of maybe... Uh, writing a video game or writing a book or writing comics and then uh, in my early 20s that's when I really started reading a ton of comics and reading a lot of uh, like images stuff and a lot of comics from Kickstarter Rick Remender was a huge inspiration with all of his creator own stuff Deadly Class Black Science all of his his stuff is amazing and I love how it's kind of high concept and like sci-fi and fantasy so he's inspired me a lot now and same with like Kirkman and stuff uh, I heard you drop it drop it there that you thought about writing um, video games I personally would love to see a Beastlands game on the major consoles. I would play the hell out of that. Oh man, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I, I love video games. That's another passion of mine. And, and I've now done some freelance writing work on a few indie video games and it, it's nice to have extra money, but I also just really love video games as well as comics. So it, it's always a dream to maybe make my own game studio or if a big studio picked up one of my series, that'd be amazing. I would love to help out and work on that. Uh, Beastlands would be a, a really cool open world game or even a Beastlands like mature anime would be awesome but we'll see in the future hopefully yeah no I'd love a be beast give me a Beastlands game on the PlayStation and oh man the exaggerated TV series oh I would, that'd be the dream man yeah I mean that would be amazing to uh I mean I, I play a lot of games I'm uh 
I'm really critical when I'm playing them. So I'm always like, I, I never went to school for, for video games, but I, I think about a lot how you can make one and the storytelling. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of new things you can do in that kind of like environment where the, the person's controlling the character. You can tell so many different stories like that. Yeah. Like, like I said, like with Beastlands, I mean, you're, you're writing on Beastlands, put that to a game and I could see it being kind of a Final Fantasy crossed with Skyrim kind of game yeah definitely yeah that'd be awesome like maybe like uh have you ever heard of the game horizon zero dawn i have i played yeah it something like that mixed with like uh breath of the wilds or ghosts of tsushima yeah i mean i mean i'm a big fan of all of those so it'd be cool to make like a little mix in with uh with the beastlands world see i think with, with beastlands especially like we're uh, slightly exaggerated it's starting to pick up now um it's I, I could see it as an anime like where you got the inspiration from i could definitely see that being made into an anime and then that'd be a dream as well yeah i'm a huge fan of anime of animated uh, shows and movies like i said ghibli and then even a lot of these newer animated movies uh, uh in the 2010s have been really good and like i'm just a you know big fan of games uh anime comics so yeah that'd be awesome to to work on as like an animated series and with kickstarter you know i, I could always do this stuff myself i feel like as long as we have the fans i mean it's hard work i'll definitely have to hire the right people to uh, help out since i don't know much about building a game or animated show but with kickstarter anything's possible we could do a card game we could do an animated series as long as we can hit our goal and we have the fans to support us um even if i don't have, have people coming to me then then we could just do it ourselves yeah uh, i think with your the two books of yours that i've looked at i think you maybe unintentionally but it came from your own mind you've made a very marketable uh series in, in both like i could 100 percent see you getting your hands on a 3d printer and making renzo action figures and beastlands action yeah figures. Yeah, no, we talked to a uh, um, uh, statue company that could do like little miniature statues of, uh, and we were thinking about doing one for Renzo and, and Mac, maybe him writing it. So, and, uh, you know, we were talking about the costs, like if we could just sign it with them or we could just kickstart it ourselves if, uh, if enough people are interested in it. But yeah, I would love to do some like statues. I love all that stuff. So that'd be really cool. As yeah, long I'm as there's interest for it. I'm a collector myself. So I'd love to have a, a Renzo and Mac statue just to, pop up there on the shelf with everything else yeah man hopefully we can get to that in the future um we even had a i don't know if you've seen this on youtube there's a um we i had a composer reach out during the last beastlands kickstarter and he actually made a theme song with the orchestra for beastlands so that's on youtube if you type in uh beastlands theme song you'll see like a video of the orchestra playing it and now he wants to do more music so we're we're talking about maybe doing um you know maybe doing like a full vinyl album for music for beastlands which is cool i never thought like i i love soundtracks i love orchestras and uh like you know video game soundtracks anime soundtracks so i never actually thought that like a soundtrack would go so good with a comic but it does and a lot of people the reception has been amazing so that's kind of what gave us the idea to maybe do more music and music i guess just goes well with comics now it's cool yeah no that would be amazing like i personally you mentioned there my the cogs start turning in my head once you mentioned uh, music for it i sit down for hours and watch a youtube video of two voice actors just reading out the comics with the score going in the background Oh man, that's a great, that's a, yeah, that's a great idea. That'd be cool. Get some voice actors going. It'd be really yeah. cool. And like the likes of Comic Story and on YouTube has made a big way of doing just literally reading and explaining comics. Yeah, yeah. That and could be something in the future. That'd be cool. I'm probably, I'm, I'm jumping miles ahead here. I just, I, got, <laughs> I read Beastlands and got so excited. Like I love both of the books, but I, I'm always honest in the show, Beastlands was my favorite of the two. Because, again, like yourself, I grew up with Pokemon and then I loved Game of Thrones as I got older. It just kind of spoke to me with a bit of nostalgia and also a bit of interest. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I grew up, yeah, watching Pokemon and then Game of Thrones, of course, was amazing. Uh, so this is kind of like uh, inspired by definitely both of those and like a cross of those. So I'm glad you liked it, though. That's, uh, that's awesome to hear. I mean, a lot of people like Beastlands because of uh, the more pet connection. And then I know some people liked uh, slightly exaggerated more with the, you know, just that crazy fantasy world. Yeah, no, um, I did. I love both, uh, but I'll always be honest and pick my favorite. And like what Beastlands was everything about it and had me kind of almost pissed off at the end of it. I was like, oh no, how's Lorenzo? Like all these poor um, keepers heads on sticks, like in front of the castle. Like I was pissed. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, we, we definitely have more coming. Like I said, the first five are done. And uh, I, I I work really hard to try to make sure these cliffhangers are good to keep people wanting more. So I'm glad the uh, those last two pages with the cliffhanger uh, did its job. Yeah, no, 100%. And like you've done a, a really good job of doing something that a lot of comics nowadays struggle with, where you actually made me feel something when I was reading it. I find a lot of comics nowadays struggle to make people actually feel something. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great compliment. Yeah, to, to, to feel something when you read a book, whether, you know, anger or more of like an emotional response. I mean, that's all you can ask for. That means that people care about the book and care about the characters and care about what they're reading. So that's a great, that's a good thing. Yeah. So I'm probably, your workload's probably all on top of you as it is, but is there anything else in the works other than um, always always stuff oh. in the works as a writer you you never i have a whole notebook filled with little ideas and then you just have to kind of choose the ones that excite you the most because you might not ever get to finish them all in your lifetime so i have uh i have a couple more pitches with artists that are that are already done um so kind of pitching that around the publishers and if there's no interest then uh i'll definitely just go to kickstarter and uh <laughs> One is another fantasy series that I'm really excited about that uh, that we already have eight pages done and the pitch is ready. So if we don't get interest back, then we're thinking maybe later this year, uh, I think I'm ready where I've done 11 Kickstarters for single issues. I think I'm ready to take the next step and do like a full graphic novel on a Kickstarter. So I think that'll be the series that we try to try to, it'll be a much bigger goal, but with my, with my support of my fans, I think we can get there and, and fund the full, like maybe a hundred page graphic novel for this new story. Yeah, well, like as we've seen there with your backers and all your other Kickstarters, you definitely have the fan base there. They're loyal, they're coming back, and they want more. Yeah, I mean, I, I just feel really fortunate that these people have found my books and like it and keep coming back and keep supporting me. I mean, I I have a mailing list, and then in the Kickstarter updates, I just always let them know that, you know, the reason I'm doing this and making a living and making these stories is because of their support, where I, I wouldn't be able to do this if they stopped coming. So I, I just feel really fortunate and lucky to found this fan base. Yeah, and like like you said, you got to quit your day job, which was was the dream. But yeah, how is it um trying to stay motivated now that we're all kind of locked inside? Um, I know personally working from home, I find it difficult to stay motivated. Yeah, it's different. Um, especially early in the pandemic, when you're watching the news, it was you know it's it's a lot of a lot of anxiety and depression when you start looking at the news and all the stuff that's happening with this pandemic. Uh, so it was hard to get much done creatively. But then, uh, at a certain time, you just have to turn off uh, social media, turn off the the TV, and uh, you know start working and creating. And you can't let that outside the outside world get you down too much. You kind of have to stay in your own head and um, and and keep you know, just watch some other entertainment, keep your mind off of that stuff so you can keep creating and stay creative and making new stuff. Yeah. And do you have a like a particular time during the day, like a schedule that you set to write in or is it just kind of whenever? The... I try, I try to stick to a schedule because I, I felt, uh, you know, working from home, you have so many distractions. There's all these things I, I said, I love like TV shows and video games and that's all right here in my yeah. home. So it's like, it's very easy to get distracted if you don't stick to a schedule. So I try to make sure I wake up early still, even though I like, I'm not like I'm going to an office or something, but get dressed and, and look presentable and get a workout in and then uh, try to get to work where either whatever I'm doing that day, maybe I'm shipping books or maybe I'm, I'm working on one of these new pitches or setting up a new Kickstarter. I tried to uh, try to get started early because I used to do a lot of my work uh, when I would do my day job. It was like a nine to five job. Um, and I would get home maybe seven o'clock at night. And then that's when I would st be used to like working on comics. I would always work on it after the day, after the day job and stay up late working on that grinding. And then, you know, go back to my day job in the morning tired. Cause I stayed up late working on comics. So now, now that I have the freedom to stay at home and, and just work on this stuff full time, I try to make sure like I stick to a schedule and, and work during the day and try to get started early. Yeah, no, I can only imagine like it's, I, with me with the podcast and with the youtube that's my thing i finish my day job and i go to work on on that and I, if i if i could make this my permanent job i know i'd find it hard to transition from doing it late night to doing it during the day exactly yeah that's the transition where you're used to that grind you know coming home and working late into the night on your kind of your hobby or your side project but then yeah it's definitely a transition where I, maybe like before I got here, I imagine it being easier. I imagine having having all this free time to just fully commit to it. I just I probably imagine I'd get so much done. But now it comes with its own challenges, where you have to kind of you don't have a manager, you don't have a boss, where you kind of have to make your own schedule and stay productive. Like I, I think it's important to I, I make goals every day. 
day. And then I, I kind of like star the top three that I need to get done. So I make sure I get, if anything, get those done, but hopefully I do more. And then, um, and then also important to, you know, working from home, you can become a workaholic and focus on this stuff too much. So making sure you enjoy life too, and, and keep working out or, you know, on the weekends, play a video game that you wanted to play or something or at night to make sure you don't, you know, cause you could get burnt out if you're only, only doing this comics work, you know, only doing, uh, this stuff where you're thinking about 24 seven, um, I'm working from home that I don't want to get burnt out. I want to make sure I, I enjoy stuff too, you know? Yeah. So even kind of as uh, your own independent comic writer, you need to make sure you have that work-life balance in place. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely a balance, uh, you know, stay balanced and don't burn yourself out. And, and I mean, I love it. So I don't want to ever stop loving this stuff. I want to make sure that I continue to do what I love for a living. So just finding the balance. Yeah. And when you're writing, is there any kind of like, do you have your certain rituals, like, you know, a certain playlist, a certain drink, a certain room? All you... Lots of coffee. And then during the pandemic, I started drinking lots of tea. Now I never used to like tea, but now lots of green tea and black tea. So I always have like some type of warm beverage here with some caffeine. Uh, and then I listen to lots of instrumental music while I'm uh, writing. Uh, uh, like Hans Zimmer is a big composer I love. So I'm always listening to new composers. I like instrumental a lot. I, I can't listen to anything with like lyrics or anything that would probably distract me too much. And then just putting on some good headphones and getting in the zone where um, you know, I'm not always scripting new comics, but when I'm actually like scripting, writing the script for a comic series, I try, I usually have a goal of maybe five pages a day for so I can get this issue done like in a week. And then sometimes you get in the zone where you do even more, you'll do 10 pages or more. Yeah. And what, what's it like kind of working, like you said, you're working from home and obviously your, um, coworkers are working from home as well, your artists and all, how is it like the communication there with them and region deadlines? I mean, luckily, um, as of now, all of my artists have been great. Like they don't miss deadlines. And uh, I mean, I, I, I've always worked with artists all over the world. So Joe, she's my co-creator on uh, Beastlands. She's from South Korea. Uh, Pius Bach, he's in Lithuania for a slightly exaggerated. So I've, I've, uh, I've always worked with my collaborators, like only through the internet. Uh, me and Pius, we, we message uh, back and forth. Me and Joe, we message through emails back and forth over the past few years where English isn't her first language, but luckily there's all this technology he's able to translate emails and we've made it work and we've grown you kind of make these friendships with your collaborators over the years of communicating with them and and it'd be cool to meet up with them maybe at a comic show in the future and actually meet them in person but as of now it's all just been through the internet anyway so it hasn't really changed too much with the pandemic and then just trying to be a good collaborator to them uh when i first started you know i was i was obviously trying to make comics a couple years before i ever made that first one so you kind of learn and, and grow as a person and become a better collaborator where now um like i i write these full scripts with like panel descriptions and stuff but um uh, they're always open to like interpret it how they want it and i rarely have to like give them feedback on layouts and stuff like i i, I want them to feel like uh they have creative influence as well so it, it's uh it's a, it's a balance being a good collaborator yeah, I can imagine. I'm just, hey, look, you've made friends there. There's a few holiday destinations from when the pandemic yeah, was over. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I mean, it's cool getting to, I mean, I love, I've only been to a few other different countries, so it'd be cool to get out there more and, and see see more of the world for sure. Yeah. And would you, like everything you mentioned there, you've already given so much, but what would you, advice would you give to someone who would be looking to go on into writing comics? And just oh, starting man. Out? starting small for sure um and then just just getting better at your craft like i feel like my early comics uh, weren't that good and then they definitely start to get better the more you make and now i feel like my new pitches are like the best things i've ever made so you're gonna get better with every comic you make but start small and like you can the the hard part a bit about being a writer is a, the the cost you as a writer you have to pay for the art you have to pay for printing i mean luckily we have kickstarter to fund this stuff but you're not going to expect to make a lot on kickstarter on your first one so you have to start small and you can write like little five page scripts 10 page scripts for practice and tell a good story in like you know 10 pages five pages and then you don't even have to hire an artist for that it's it's free for you to just write that and perfect your craft and then another big thing for me where i feel like i improved a lot was hiring an editor to kind of critique my stuff and give me notes so i would hire comic editors to give me feedback and then that's where i really improved um and and i feel like i've i feel like i'm still getting better so hopefully my new stuff is even better yeah um great advice there just brought up there and actually it was a question i've always wondered about kickstarter comics and um, in terms of the artists that you hire to work with you um how is it kind of hiring them before you know you've reached your goal like is there some stress there about knowing whether you can actually provide 
There and, was in the in the past for sure because um, you know I put so much of my own money into it for like the first issue of my fi- sci-fi series, The Wild Cosmos, where I spent hundreds of dollars, and we, I think we had ha- half of the comic done at that point where the Kickstarter is live. And if we don't hit our goal, then I just wasted hundreds of dollars on art. And uh, you know, luckily things worked out where we hit the goal, and then I could afford to pay for the rest of the comic. And you know, that's why so many people have day jobs when you're doing these these like kind of passion projects because I, I needed money to pay for the art. So I was working, you know, my day job. I hated my job, but it paid the bills and it paid for it. Pay, it got me here where I was able to pay for the art for all these comic series. So um, you definitely need some type of job to to have income to pay for that stuff because you're the writer and, and it's kind of your responsibility to pay these artists. And now, luckily, um, we usually have sometimes we'll have the comic completely finished because uh, I'll have enough extra money to pay them or these artists have been working with me long enough where they trust that I'll pay them once I get the Kickstarter money, since we have a, we, we can usually expect that we'll be successful with these issues now. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it must be a great feeling to know that you kind of you have it set now. How was that feeling, though, the day you knew that you could quit your day job and do this full time? Describe to me oh, how you man. felt. It's, uh, it's the best feeling ever. That was always the goal. And I, I, like I said, I, I, you know, I've hated like every day job I had. My goal in life was always to do something that I love and make a living doing something I like. So to be able to to quit and do this full time. I mean, it was scary, though, because um, I, I didn't know how well these Kickstarters will keep doing. I didn't know we were going to make 50000 later that later that next year with Beastland. So once you, uh, you know, you always stress about money and want to make sure you can pay your bills. But luckily, I'm uh, I'm young enough where I don't have too many commitments. I'm not married. I don't have kids or anything yet so like i'm able to do i'm able to take these risks where you know you always hear like if you take these risks um you know that's the only way you can get rewarded where it might not work out but you'll learn but luckily uh you know luckily it was even scarier because right when i quit then the pandemic and then you know i'm, I'm wondering how things will go on kickstarter but things have worked out so I, I can't complain it's uh i'm really happy and really fulfilled to be doing this yeah well look the pandemic might have actually help like you said it's yeah it might have helped go to restaurants or go to pubs so you know <laughs> It might have helped. So yeah, things have worked out. It's crazy. Yeah, no. Um, but with this now, do you have any kind of stress still in the back of your mind that if the ball stops rolling, there is, I know with yourself now, you're established as a writer and I don't fear you getting a job ever. But do you ever have that bit of stress in the back of your mind that it could all just go? Yeah, of course, of course. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I've i saved the money. I, I try to be smart with the, the finances of how well these Kickstarters are doing. So I put a lot in savings. I've paid off a lot of bills. But uh, so luckily, I haven't had to stress about money in a while. I have enough money to pay rent and stuff. So um, I mean, yeah, you always have that fear. Like, like I launched this new Kickstarter this year. This was my first Kickstarter of 2021. And you're just like, well, I hope things keep going well. You know, you gotta, you gotta work your hardest and prepare and market it the best you can, but you gotta, you just kind of hope things keep going well and, uh, and keep growing so that you can keep doing this as a living. And then luckily I've signed a few deals with publishers. So hopefully that can help bring in some income in the future. And I would love to do some more video game writing work for, for money there. And then, you know, maybe if I can find some more publishers to work with or some more work for hire gigs, that'd be fun too. Yeah, no, and listen, all the respect in the world to you for having the the balls to take that risk. And it was scary, man. It's uh, <laughs> terrifying, but it was the best thing I've ever done for sure. Yeah, it's it, like I'd love to do it myself, but unfortunately, I'm not sure how good I'd be at writing. And I ha- I just I'll put myself down here with all the balls to take that risk right now. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of people do that do podcasts, uh, you know, people, if you grow your podcast enough, you're able to get advertisers and a lot of people podcast for a living now. So it's, it's with the world of the internet, you never know what's possible with things like Kickstarter, Patreon, you have all these things where you can, where your fans can support you. It's cool. Yeah, no, it is. Dude. Like for all of its flaws and faults, the internet has done a lot of good for um, lots of people. good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Especially like creative people like it's. Definitely. There's so many different ways to put yourself out there and make a living now where, you know, becoming a comic writer today is where you, you just kind of have to make your own stuff and hopefully you get discovered and hopefully it's good enough where you can uh, transition into being a full-time creator. But I know back then uh, it was all about working for like the big two. And, you know, when you hear about like Robert Kirkman's journey from Marvel to then create your own stuff, it was completely different than what it is now in the age of Kickstarter and all this stuff. Yeah. And, it might be controversial, but I'm pretty sure some writers on Kickstarter might actually be paid better than some on the big two. 
Yeah, man, it, they might be, like, especially because, you know, there's no limit on a Kickstarter. Your goal could be $10,000, but you could always make 60000 80000 So if you do that well, you definitely, and, and you're getting all that money, you know, it's not going to some company where you're only getting half or something after that. Yeah. So, yeah, no, um, I'm running out here. Literally, you have, you're one of the few guests that have answered my questions so, like, thoroughly that. <laughs> My, my follow-ups were answered before I got the chance to ask them and I love those type of interviews. <laughs> we want to just uh, plug it out there to people who are listening. I know it's reached its goal, but plug them Kickstarters and the Yeah, dates. so so slightly exaggerated, one and two. You can get issues one and two on there. That will be live until March 10th uh, right now. So another like five or so days. Um, and then all of my other comics are available is there as well. You can get Beastlands one through five on that Kickstarter. You can get the PDF of my other sci-fi series, The Wild Cosmos. Um, so just go on Kickstarter and search slightly exaggerated. exaggerated. And then um, on my social media, I have links for all that um, at Curtis Clow on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter, where you have links to all the Kickstarters there too. Yeah, and all of our listeners, I think, should go over and give uh, Curtis a follow on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to stay up to date with all these. I know I'm turning notifications on now, so I know when this Beastlands trade comes out because I, mean, I need to get my hands on that. And I would definitely be, even if I had to pay extra, requesting a signed copy. Yeah, man, I'm always happy. That was another cool thing about Comic Cons is you get to sign the books for everyone. But I always sign all the Kickstarter copies too. It's it's cool to you know have some of that personal where you sign everything for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm probably a terrible interviewer, but you've, you've answered all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you any other kind of uh, media or promotional things coming up? Uh, just a slightly exaggerated Kickstarter right now. Um, I just try to do as many interviews as I could for that. And then in a couple months, we'll be back on Kickstarter with uh, Beastlands 6 and 7. So I'd love to chat to you then. I could, I could send you some more PDFs for uh, Beastlands to check out. I will I will not say no to that. You will not catch <laughs> me saying no to that. I'm, I'm invested now. One issue in, I'm invested. Nice. Uh, look, I won't keep you too much, too much longer. I'm probably um, helping some procrastination here. <laughs> yeah it's always time to i'm actually shipping out books for one of the kickstarters right now so I'm, i'll get back to shipping some uh some orders yeah oh if someone's if someone's comics late please don't come after me with uh, <laughs> torches and pitchforks <laughs> um, look curtis it was fantastic talking to you and i wish you all the best on the books they're outstanding and i very rarely read a book outside the big two there's been only a handful but i'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on your work going forward Thank you. That, that means a lot, really. Uh, thanks for reading them. Thanks for liking them and, and having me on to talk about it. I really appreciate it.